Hello, good evening, and Kanbanwa, YouTube. It's Tabby again, and as I promised you some time ago, I'm back for the third installment of Flat Earth Follies. The more astute of you will note that this version isn't numbered like the earlier ones. Well, that has to do with the changes we're making to the format, even. I thought the previous script was a terrible way to do this thing. So rather than deal in set individuals being idiotic each video, I'm going to take on specific claims and tear those apart using bits of the material collected for doing things the old way. What that means is less pain on your part from the rapid fire face bombs whilst having to watch all of the stupid. Just the occasional bit so we can prove that there really are people out there that will say things that mind bogglingly silly. Conversely, you'll get to see more of my shining face during any given video. We are still harvesting particularly egregious examples from videos we see, and we'll show the relevant bits as needed. We won't need them for this particular claim, though. In a thread that started some time ago, a particularly perfidious ignoramus that we'll call. Huh. What should we call him? Bah. Screw it. Let's just pick a random name from this book here. Let me see. First name on this page is. Eric. Yes, that'll do nicely. Eric made the utterly ridiculous claim that gravity simply doesn't exist, despite all evidence to the contrary. When prompted for substantiation, he responded with, of all things, a helium balloon. I'll just let that sink in for a moment. Right about now, anyone that's spent more than an hour in a classroom is currently recovering from the high speed face bombing they just experienced. What I might recommend for the future is that you get yourself a nice thick oven mint and a bottle of your preferred paint thinner before watching any more of this series. Go ahead. I'll wait. Instruction. Of course, Eric wasn't the only one to say something so utterly devoid of intelligence. If he had been, there'd be no need to make a complete series. There have been a few others that have made this claim, or one a lot like it. It seems that the feckless flat teramites of the world have a few theories of their own on how it is we stay attached to this little spheroid we call a planet. We're going to take this first video to explain in detail why this example isn't the crushing defeat Tarek so strenuously insists it is. This could get a little technical for the flat teramites, so I'll try and be gentle. The first thing you have to understand when dealing with a helium balloon or indeed any substance, is that density means something. If the object you're dealing with has a net density less than the medium in which it finds itself, it's going to float. We see this all the time in the bathtub, where a wood block, a rubber ducky, or bars of certain types of soap will float, rather than sink to the bottom. I'm guessing Eric hasn't had a lot of experience with such an esoteric device as a wash tub. You could do the same experiment in a sink, I suppose, but I'm not sure such a thing would have occurred to him. Water is incompressible at any pressure we'd be familiar with, and in fact compresses only by about 5% or so at a thousand atmospheres. A wood block, on the other hand, isn't quite that dense, and will float until it takes on a significant amount of water, as wood is wont to do. If you're the adventurous type, and have a body of water near you large enough that you can completely submerge yourself, you can see this in action for yourself. The human body is also less dense than water, and as such will float. If you have some fat on you, the effect is even more pronounced. The first eureka moment for this idea actually comes from a story about the Greek philosopher Archimedes, who when posed the problem of determining whether or not the local king was getting ripped off, got into a bath and noticed that his fat ass made the water level rise. This phenomenon is known as displacement, and it's critical to understanding why Eric's example doesn't work. If you take a given mass, and drop it into a medium like water, for example, you can determine the density of whatever it was that you dropped into it. What's density, you ask? No, it's not a measure of the thickness of some flat teramite's skull. It's mathematically defined as the mass of an object divided by its volume. Whatever mass you're dealing with will displace an amount of the medium it's been placed in. 
when Archimedes placed an amount of solid gold equal to what was handed over to the jeweler in one pot of water, and the jewelry that was being questioned in another, there was a noticeable difference in the water level in the two pots. The jeweler in question promptly misplaced his head. Back to Eric's claim. With a helium balloon, there are a couple of small differences. 1. We're not talking about water here, although if you put one in water it'll bob up even faster. The medium in question is air, which acts very much like a fluid when tested. There's a reason they use water tanks to test aerodynamics for cars and aircraft, and it's because water moving at speed will show the same characteristics when a blockage is placed in front of it. They can then add pretty dyes to it so they can see what's actually going on. It's a common test employed regularly by engineers and scientists around the world. A balloon works the same way. If the density of the inflated balloon works up to less than the density of air, the balloon floats up. The volume of gas inside it pushes the walls out, which gives it its shape. There are a few things you could use to do this, such as water, air, helium or hydrogen. Any old thing that expands to fill the container will do the trick. You could even use mercury or boron if you really felt like it, but I wouldn't want to be nearby if the balloon popped. If you overfill it, and the pressure inside exceeds the pressure outside enough to stretch the container past its breaking point, it'll pop. That's what eventually happens to balloons sent up through the atmosphere. The pressure outside the balloon goes down, and the contents expand until it explodes. Pretty simple stuff, that. If you've ever blown up a balloon using your own lungs, then you know that they sink. It's because the air in question is a bit denser than the air surrounding it, so the force of gravity acts on it more than the amount of thrust delivered by buoyancy, and so it gets pushed down by the lighter medium. If it's dropped onto a body of water, it'll float there. Water is denser than air, after all. Helium isn't nearly as dense as air, you see, and unless the balloon is made out of something very dense, lead, for example, it will rise as the air around the balloon flows under the balloon and forces it up. It's the same theory they used to float blimps. The Hindenburg was an example of this, after a fashion. Of course the difference is that they used hydrogen, which reacts badly, when exposed to sparks or flame. Both gases we're talking about are lighter than air, which is some 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other gases. For the same volume, normal air is significantly more dense and so our helium balloon will displace the air around it. Where is it going to go? Straight up, at least until either the balloon pops, it's stopped by some outside source like the hand of a child on the string, or the density of the air outside equals that of the helium inside. Of course, that last doesn't happen, and so our balloon, once released, is doomed. Ok, time for a bit of a side note. What happens if you tie it on a string and watch it for a while or six? Eventually, the helium will escape through pores in the balloon, and after it looses enough, it'll start to sink. The mass of the balloon is still in play here, and so when the amount of helium on board isn't enough to maintain the volume of the container, the density of the combined total rises, with predictable results. When this was brought to his attention, however, Eric stuck to his guns. He demanded that the larger mass of Earth would be sufficient to keep the balloon on the ground. What he fails to realize is that our helium balloon doesn't have enough mass to affect Earth in any measurable way, and that the forces involved in buoyancy will exceed the hold gravity exerts. If you want that a bit simpler, buoyancy is functionally the same as thrust, as the heavier air gathers under it, the balloon is pushed up. It won't quite be 9.8 meters per second, per second but it's more than enough to head upwards. Gravity is in fact acting on it to slow its ascent, but until buoyancy has had its say, gravity isn't going to have enough of an effect to bring it down. I'll leave a couple of Wikipedia links in the description for those that want to go over the finer details. It's not a perfect source, but they do include links at the bottom for references that are more reliable. As you can see, it's all about mass and volume. A big thing that's lighter than air will displace air down. A small thing that isn't will stay put, or fall if placed in a medium that's not as dense as the object in question.
What rate it falls at will depend entirely on what the medium is, but air has a very small amount of resistance to very dense objects, and so any object dropped in our atmosphere at a height x will accelerate downwards at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared until it reaches the speed at which what resistance the air has, more commonly known as drag, matches the amount of pull gravity has on that mass. This is what's referred to as terminal velocity. Even though you've stopped accelerating, you're still falling, and unless you've found a way to increase the amount of drag you generate somehow, you're going to splatter yourself across the local geography in very short order. You can see this watching skydivers maneuver through the air, pointing head or feet down to speed up, or flattening themselves out parallel to the ground to slow down. Birds do this as well, diving to catch prey, or flee from predators, and spreading their wings to rise on warm air currents. The same is true of submarines. They take on water to dive, and expel it to rise. Different medium, same mechanics. Did you remember to pack a parachute Eric? I certainly hope so. The very thing you had to discount the existence of in order for your purported evidence to work the way you claimed is the thing that is necessary to save your moronic backside from being turned into fertilizer in some farmer's field once you reach the ground. Of course, had you paid the slightest bit of attention in elementary school, you would have known that. You didn't, and as a result you are a brainless git that cites answers in Genesis in response to criticism on your praise for a video on how galaxies don't exist, which itself makes the demonstrably false claim that we can't see light that hasn't been reflected off of some other object first. In fact, that was what got you our complete and undivided attention. So then, that's about it for Eric's little objection. He did make an attempt to provide a source for his bullshit conjecture, in the form of a self-published paper by another peddler of Wu. It ended up in the hands of Marty Mir 81, who did a beautiful off-the-cuff obliteration of it a while back. Marty did a far better job of it than I could have, and so I'm leaving a link to that video in the description along with the promised Wikipedia pages. I strongly recommend you watch it because Marty sheds quite a bit of light in the corners of Eric's vapid excuse for a conjecture. Shortly thereafter, Eric again fell on his face with yet another outrageous claim. Of course, I expect Eric and his fellow fiends of the Magic Sky Fairy to descend on this video like a pack of howler monkeys bent on scattering their feces all over the walls with cries of. It's a conspiracy. I remind you all that every concept we've covered with the exception of gravity as a fundamental force has been known to scholars for a lot longer than there's been a United States, or any other government that currently exists. If memory serves, the current British system of government was already in place by the time Newton was born, and thus our current concept of gravity. Next time around, we'll get a bit deeper into gravity, and how it further stuffs up the claim that Terra is flat despite every other body we can see over a certain mass and size being some variety of spheroid. From there, we'll tackle the claim I mentioned a moment ago about light. To the surprise of no educated person ever, gravity has an effect on that as well, and we might as well cover gravity before we head over there. Not to worry though, there are a lot of other claims made by flat earth loons that don't require a significant amount of math to turn them into a fine pink mist. We'll cover those before we get into the material that simply must have it, and then get stuck into the gory details. Right after Eric takes the 30 second stupid challenge, that is. That's it for me for now. I'll be back sooner rather than later for our next installment. Until then, stay skeptical.